Welcome to Come Follow Me. Today we're going to talk about the Doctrine and Covenants, section six through nine. Okay. Last week we had Martin Harris. This week we have Oliver Cowdery. Oliver, he enters the story. Tell me a little bit about the history of Oliver Cowdery up to this point. How does he come into our story? Well, his brother, I don't remember his name. His brother was going to uh, teach at a school, but something happened, so he put Oliver instead, and Oliver boards with the Smith family. Okay. What were you going to say, Miranda? Uh, I was just going to mention that it was in the Smith family residence. Yes. Living in the Smith family residence. His brother's name is Lyman. That's right. <laughs> but also, we have to realize that this was a usual practice for school teachers at this time to board with the families of some other pupils. Mm -hmm. So there he is living with Smith family. So nobody can stand but to tell him about this weird business about the plates, right? And he spends a little time kind of trying to get some information from Mr. Smith, Joseph's father. And it takes a little bit of time for his father to trust Oliver enough to share the story. Which makes sense. Yeah. After all the persecution that both Joseph and his family have gone through, it makes sense that he's a little hesitant to mm -hmm. talk about this. Mm -hmm. And he just gives him a sketch, he says. That's how Lucy describes this. It, um, however, he gained my husband's confidence so far as to obtain a sketch of the facts relative to the plates. That would say to me, he just kind of gave him just some basics, basic details, not too much. But after receiving this, he is, it's just so delighting to him. Something about it just speaks to his soul and he cannot stop thinking about it and thinking and thinking and thinking. And he just has this thought of, I'm supposed to write for him. And so when he expresses this then to Joseph's father, um, and that he was really just determined to pay Joseph a visit, it, he also spends a little bit of time praying about it and wanting to know the truthfulness of what he's hearing. So he's pondering, he's thinking, he's praying. And he, um, he says, so the subject upon which we were yesterday conversing seems working in my very bones. I mean, just if you've ever had this kind of a, a thought and it's from the Lord and it just works on you and works on you, you can't leave it alone. It won't leave you alone, right? In my very bones, he describes it, and I cannot for a moment get it out of my mind. Finally, I resolved on what I will do. Samuel, I understand, is going down to Pennsylvania to spend the spring with Joseph. I shall make my arrangements to be ready to accompany him thither by the time he recovers his health. For I have made it a subject of prayer, and I firmly believe that it is the will of the Lord that I should go. If there is a work for me to do in this thing, I am determined to attend to it. So he advised him to really seek a testimony for himself, to really know, because it's a really important thing to understand if you are doing what the Lord wants you to do, that the course you're pursuing is according to the Lord's purposes. That's really important. It's actually a part of faith. If you if you understand and have the faith that the course you're pursuing is in accordance with the Lord's will, it's really hard to get you off that course, right? And, and then we also get a little bit from Joseph on this as well, because Joseph had been needing a scribe for a short time. Who's been helping him with this a little bit? Emma. Emma helped a little bit. Martin. Martin, Martin helped a little bit. That's where we get our 116 lost pages, right? But he came and he starts, stated, he said, this is what Joseph says about him. He stated to me that having been teaching school in the neighborhood where my father resided, and my father being one of those who sent to the school, he went to board for a season at his house. And while there, the family related to him the circumstance of my having received the plates. And accordingly, he had come to make inquiries of me. Two days after the arrival of Mr. Cowdery, being the 7th of April, I commenced to translate the Book of Mormon, and he began to write for me, which having continued for some time, I inquired of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim and obtained the following. So about the 7th of April, he begins to write for Joseph. This next revelation that we're going to talk about, section 6, 
is also in April. So for some time is somewhere in the time of April. Maybe it's a matter of a week or a couple of weeks, but he begins to translate for him. And so we get this wonderful section given mostly to Oliver. We have things in here for Joseph, but this is given mostly to Oliver so that he can have some assurance. And it's given to him through the Yerm and Thummim. Through the Yerm and Thummim, which Joseph received back. And so when he lost the manuscript pages, the angel took the Urim and Thummim. The angel took the plates. And after Joseph had sufficiently repented, then both were given back to him to continue the work. And that's very important to remember. And so here we are with this, oh gosh, amazing, amazing section. Now, Miranda, you really liked verse two. So I'd like you to talk about verse two with us for a minute. So this is something we kind of, we hear a lot. And this is a verse that tells us that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and mm -hmm. it divides things asunder. And it's kind of an interesting thought. We live in a time where we get lots of words of comfort mm -hmm. and we forget that when we're not being righteous, that the truth hurts. It will. Yes. It will hurt. It does divide asunder. Mm -hmm. The word of God is what divides the righteous from the wicked. Right. And if we're paying attention and heed to the word of God, that dividing asunder is like, I'll just chop off that part that's not right. And you can push that away and keep what's true, right? It will divide. It will take away what's not true if you're heeding the word of the Lord. So I, I really appreciate that. It really puts an image in your mind, right? It might be a great activity at some point to just take think about a two-edged sword, Um Sometimes museums have swords. Sometimes you've got somebody who's a sword collector in your family. So if you know someone, if you're watching at home and you know somebody who has swords, take a look at swords. They're not all two-edged. They're not all two-edged. A two-edged sword cuts no matter which way you draw it, right? You've got some swords that just have one side, a generally a knife in your drawer and you know, in your kitchen, one edge. One edge cuts, not two. But when two cut, no matter which way that sword is drawn, it will cut. And they do have those. So if you know somebody who has swords, you might really enjoy getting a little bit of uh, information about swords. And then maybe they'll even let you handle them. I don't happen to know somebody like that. <laughs> but it, it is a really fascinating thing. Now, in, in last section, when we had verse section four, and Joseph Sr. gets a revelation. It's as if you're... If you have desires to the work, you're called, right? Desires to the work. Now we get, if you will reap, right? If you'll thrust in your sickle and reap, that you are called. Whoever will thrust in his sickle and reap, the same is called of God. That's found in verse four. So that same of just, if you are feeling those impressions upon your mind, you're probably being called. Now go find out for sure, right? You want to make sure you're doing the right thing. But when it comes to the work of the Lord, he has this tendency to kind of give us this calling right inside our very soul, right inside our very soul that makes us want to do this work. And so that's really, really interesting. And, and of course, that same ask, seek, knock thing, right? This, we see it, hear it so much in the scriptures, sometimes we don't take it seriously. This is a formula for receiving revelation. We're going to talk a lot about revelation today. So then we get into a seeking. Joseph it's not a hide and seek game, right? What are we told to seek? What are we told not to seek? What did Joseph and Hiram, or no, sorry, Joseph Oliver. and Oliver get right here? So they're told to seek for wisdom mm -hmm. and to keep the commandments and to seek for the cause of Zion, yep. to establish the cause of Zion. Bring forth and establish the cause. But seek not for riches, for riches, or at least not in this life. Mm -hmm. If you're blessed with them, great. How can you use them to build the kingdom? All things must be used to honor him. Exactly. Um, but he says, don't seek for them, but seek for the mysteries of God to be unfolded. Mm -hmm. And what does he say they'll get if they do that? Uh, well, he says that they will receive eternal life and he who has eternal life is rich is rich so as you're seeking through this particular section you will notice that the lord promises to them 
specifically Oliver, but to them multiple times, eternal life, salvation, eternal life, be with me. He promises it in several different times and in several different ways. And it really is an attainable goal. Do you know that sometimes people just say, I just can never make it, so I'm just going to give up? Breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. We must be seeking it, and that wisdom is important. And is there anything wrong with being rich? Are there people that are blessed with riches and are still righteous? There are. There are. And they, Martin Harris being one of them, but he was sometimes tempted by his worldly goods. It is an actual test to be blessed with riches. And of course, you know, you have to really keep your mind focused on the work of the Lord. And we learn in section nine what missionaries are supposed to teach to the world. Right there, he was, they were just told to seek wisdom. But let's go into section nine. Joseph, will you take a look at that one with us too? Section nine or so, I'm sorry, verse nine? Verse nine of section six. Don't turn pages. <laughs> Say nothing. But repentance unto this generation. Yeah. Now, when generation is used like this, just like last week, when the Lord said, none, this generation shall have my words through you, he means dispensation. He means dispensation. So the message our missionaries are to give, and really prophets and apostles, repentance, repentance, repentance. And what should we be seeking daily, day in and day out? Am I right before the Lord? Repentance, repentance, repentance. Not to trifle with it. Not to play around with, well, I'm just going to repent of that again. But in that way of moving forward, what lack I yet? Where do I need to have that two-edged sword cut a little bit more off? Trim it, trim it, trim it. Until we are unified with Christ. Unified in the work and purposes of God. So that's really super important to remember that the message of repentance is what we really need. And, and he's got some spiritual gifts given to him, and he's going to be able to know mysteries. So we teach people who are investigating repentance. But we're given the commandment to seek after the mysteries or wisdom, and we can be blessed with that knowledge as we seek after them righteously and for the right purposes. Because it helps us to draw closer to him. But again, trifle not with sacred things. And here's one other promise. If you hold out faithful to the end, thou shalt be saved in the kingdom of God, the greatest of all the gifts of God. No greater gift than the gift of salvation. There's twice now. Here's the promise of salvation, eternal life, these eternal riches. So super important things going on here. Now, remember what we just talked about with the history. Oliver has been seeking before he ever got there, to know if what he's told is true, if he's supposed to be a scribe, this section is kind of given for him. Catherine, you were really enjoying 15 and 16 there. Really you want to talk quickly, about that? Yes, go ahead. Before we jump ahead, in verse 13, um, it talks about, you know, there's no gift greater than salvation, mm -hmm. and so we need to seek for righteous gifts. Right. Righteous gifts. And the Lord blesses us with gifts as we are righteous, doesn't he? Multiple gifts. Catherine, 15 and 16, oh, those are some that you really enjoy. I was just talking about 16. Right, but they go together, but... so if you don't mind. So 15 starts with, Thou knowest that thou hast inquired of me, and I did enlighten thy mind. He's specifically talking now to Oliver. You inquired, I enlightened thy mind. I tell thee these things that thou mayest know that thou hast been enlightened by the spirit of truth. I told you we were going to talk a lot about Revelation this week. And what does 16 tell him? Well, 16 tells him that God's the only one who knows his thoughts. Mm -hmm. He's the only one who could know that, right? I tell thee these things as a witness that the words or the work which thou hast been writing are true. And then he gives him some commandments. Be diligent. Stand by my servant Joseph. Now we all need to do that. Stand by my servant Joseph faithfully in whatsoever circumstances he may be for the word's sake. Stand by Joseph. And then 19, admonish him in his faults. 
receive admonition of him. Be patient, sober, temperate, have patience, faith, hope, charity. There's this these list of Christ-like traits again, right? Things we need to be seeking to obtain. Linda, do you have a thought there? You're just looking at me with intensity. 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 Yeah. Okay, um, excellent. I have a thought. Yes, Joseph. Right? It, I always thought it was interesting. Stand with <clears throat> Joseph. Yeah. In other words, be his friend through this. He mm -hmm. means someone. Yeah. He's carried the load alone. Finally, someone comes along to help carry the load. And then Oliver is told if he does this, keeps the commandments of God. This is another one that just brings this beautiful image to your mind. Right, Miranda? You wanted to bring that one out. So 20 is a kind of an interesting one. It says, Behold, thou art Oliver. And I remember when I was younger, I was told, maybe you should put your name in that little space. Mm -hmm. And he tells him to treasure up the words in his heart, to be faithful and diligent in keeping the commandments. And if he did that, then he would encircle him in the arms of his love. Mm -hmm. And I love that imagery. Don't we all want to be encircled with our Savior's love? Yeah, it just it feels like a hug, doesn't it? Yeah. And not in a buddy-buddy a buddy way. I think it's super important to realize that he is our God, right? We, we seek after him. We seek to be like him. But he's like, hey, buddy. It's not that kind of relationship. It is one of awe and, and, and reverence and respect. That the thought of being encircled in the arms of his love is, oh, you know, <laughs> there's, there's no words for it. And then you really um, also were talking about the darkness in 21. Yeah, so... 21 talks about how uh, Jesus Christ is the light in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And I think sometimes you don't realize what the darkness is, but darkness is spiritual darkness. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is the light. Right. Right. So it's really important to be in that light. Now, still talking to Oliver, these next three verses are helping him to recognize the answer he received. You look at 22, if you desire a further witness, so you already have 21 verses. If you desire a further witness than what you've just received, cast your mind upon the night you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know the truth concerning these things, of these things. Here is a key. You need to know this. How do you know it's from the Lord? Did I not speak peace? to your mind concerning the matter. What greater witness can you have than from God? What is one thing Satan cannot counterfeit? Peace. 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 When receiving or seeking inspiration and revelation, it is so easy to get caught up in emotions, bodily feelings, right? They can be imitated by Satan, but he cannot imitate peace. So recognizing this is really, really important. And he says to him, Now behold, you have received a witness, for if I have told you things which no man knoweth, have you not received a witness? He hadn't told Joseph or Joseph's parents or family in any way what he'd experienced and what he'd gone through. And so it, that was important for Oliver and um, helped him to know he was definitely in the right place, doing the right thing. This was all true. And we get another thing about riches here in a couple of verses. Lay for up for yourselves treasures in heaven. They're told that if they go and teach this, even if the people reject their words, you're blessed. They can't do anything more to you than me. It's the Savior, right? Can, can, he, can they do anything to us that's worse than what they did to Jesus Christ? There's not. And if they do unto you as they have done unto me, blessed are ye, for ye shall dwell with me in glory. There's no one of those promises, right, of eternal glory. But if they reject not my words, beautiful, which shall be established by the testimony which shall be given, blessed are they, and then shall ye have joy in the fruit of your labors. So if they reject you, you'll get my glory. You don't lose anything. If they accept you, they have the joy and you get the joy of the fruit of your labors. That's a win-win. Might not feel like it in the moment, but it's a win-win. Either way, you win. 
you win. And so it's really, you know, he, he then talks about this importance of coming together. What does he say there in 32? Where two or three are gathered in my name as touching one thing, there will I be in the midst of them. Does this remind you of anything out of the Book of Mormon? Any stories in the Book of Mormon where two or three are gathered in his name? Actually, it's right after the Savior comes. Mm -hmm. And all of his disciples in the Americas are gathered together because what do we call ourselves? Yeah. And the Savior comes and he tells him, he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be. Right? And so that's the same thing he tells them here. This is, this is a blessing. And we're told one more time, fear not. 33, fear not to do good. 34, fear not, little flock. 36, this is our scripture to memorize this week. Everybody together with me. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not, fear not. Easy to memorize, right? That's Doctrine and Covenants 6 and 36. But how important it is to remember. Look unto him in every thought. Seek to honor him in all things. Doubt not, fear not. And here's what Oliver writes. After we had received this revelation, Oliver Cowdery stated to me that after he had gone to my father's to board, and after the family had communicated to him concerning my having obtained the plates, that one night... After he had retired to bed, he called upon the Lord to know if these things were so. And the Lord manifested to him that they were true. But he had kept the, the circumstance entirely secret and had mentioned it to no one. So that after this revelation was given, he knew that the work was true. Because no being living knew of the thing alluded to in the revelation, but God and himself. Now, after that, we get section eight, which maybe doesn't seem to fit in with everything else going on here. Do you mean or seven, seven, sorry. But Oliver and Joseph are translating. They must have been having a conversation about John the Revelator. One of them thinks that he lived. One of them thinks that he died and maybe was translated. And they can't agree. So they decide, okay, we're going to ask the Lord using the and Thummim to get the answer to this. And we get what is basically... A translation of something John wrote down on a, on a scroll about the fact that John indeed was a, remained alive. In fact, in verse 3, um, it says that John is to prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people yeah. about what he's seen and what he's experienced. Mm -hmm. John is somebody that Joseph saw multiple times. He's the John of the Peter, James, and John. Yeah. He's the John of the book of Revelation. And so he's someone that Joseph had interaction with. And Joseph even said at one time that he was working with the ten tribes to prepare them to be returned. So he's still working. Still has things to do. Lots to do. Eight and nine have to do with Oliver wanting to receive Revelation. The ability to translate revelation. He's seeing what Joseph's doing. His heart just says, oh, I want to do that too. So what happens here? He's told a lot about the spirit as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember what verse it's in right now. Um, but in verse two, in one of the verses, verse three, He's told that the spirit of revelation that he's seeking for is actually the same spirit that guided Moses to uh, part the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And verse set two says, I'll tell you in your mind and in your heart. Mind is your thought process, right? Your heart is kind of the center of your emotions. That's how we think about it. So mind and heart, you've got to be having that confirmation to both places to know if something is true. And it is. It's the same gift that Moses had, but he also promises him the gift of Aaron. We do not know much about the gift of Aaron, except that it is a gift of God, that it was given to Aaron, and Oliver has promised that same gift. We are taught to seek after the best of gifts, right? Mm -hmm. Because they help us to help in the Lord's work. Now, 
He gets the permission to translate. He's like, okay, and he sits down. And I don't know what he did. We don't even get any of the story except he couldn't translate. He took, he took the thought say it was to ask me. That's right. We get this in section nine. So he started, he wanted to translate, but he couldn't do it. It was too hard. So he starts to just transcribe again. Okay. I'll just write what you say, Joseph. And the Lord says, be patient, my son. It is wisdom in me. And it is not expedient that you should translate at this present time. I also like what he says in verse six to mm -hmm. Oliver. He says, don't murmur. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with you this way for my own purposes. Okay. And now we get some really important verses on what not to do when receiving revelation. This is really important. It's we, we had a long discussion as a family as we were preparing today about how to receive revelation and, and what it feels like. And, and dad shared an experience where he had received revelation. And I said to him, okay, what did that feel like? How did you know? And he said, I knew. <laughs> you really, really, really can't describe the feeling when you know. There's a direct difference between receiving revelation and knowing and uh, not receiving it. You, there, there's a definite feeling about that. Mm -hmm. So verse 7, the Heavenly Father says to him, Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought save it was to ask me. What did he tell him in eight? Study it out in your mind and in your heart, right? I'll tell you in your mind and in your heart. And so in verse eight, he says, you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. What does this match up with in the Book of Mormon? It's Moroni 10, mm -hmm. 3 through 5. Yes, sometimes we leave out sec chapter or verse, verse 3. And that is the study it out in your mind portion. We actually get the same pattern from Moroni. Having it appear twice in the scriptures is a sure way of knowing this is a true principle, pattern, key, formula to understand. Study it out in your mind. You have to go find out. This is part of the process of revelation is, you know, getting some information, studying it out and making sense of what the information is that you have. And then you can take it to the Lord and say, this is what I've studied. This is what I think it is. Will you reveal to me if I am correct? I mean, I'm just I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but that's the kind of process that he's describing here. If it's right, I'll cause your bosom to burn within you. That's the heart part of it. If it's not, a stupor of thought. Okay? This is a process. It is a very sacred process. So this process here is a very personal one. This is why President Nelson is telling each of us, you must learn to receive personal revelation. It's that vital. He's not the first prophet to tell us that. Joseph Smith taught it. Brigham Young. I mean, you just go down all 15 of them. You're going to get the same kind of teachings. We have to know how to receive personal revelation. This section is, a couple of sections is really important to that. Even in section six, cast your mind upon the night. Did I not speak peace to your heart? Right? So really important sections here. Now, he's told that part of what kept him from being able to receive it was fear. Doubt not, fear not, right? Fear not, little flock. The fear is a really uh, damaging thing. We must be careful of fear. But I love this part. They're told that they aren't condemned. Took so take a look there at verse 12. You guys see that one? Yes. <laughs> Neither of you have I condemned. You're not wrong. He's not wrong. It's okay. We're going to keep Joseph translating. I haven't condemned you. You're not in trouble. <laughs> sometimes you feel like you're in trouble when you're not in trouble. Yeah, sometimes. I, I really loved this particular verse because it was the Lord saying, Neither of you are in trouble. You're doing just fine. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, 
Exactly. Exactly. All right. They've been called to the work. They're told to stand fast in it. And that's a good admonition for all of us. Let's sing. Um, our activity for this week. Oh, that's right. I almost forgot the activity. Miranda, will you explain it to us? Because you're kind of the get to spearhead this one. So because Oliver was uh, writing. Scribe. Yeah, he was scribing. <laughs> he was being a scribe. For Joseph, uh, we decided that this week would be good to focus on our manuscript pages. So the manuscript pages, of course, are our memorized scriptures. And we're just going to, we're going to make some templates and kind of show you kind of the idea. Right. You'll find that on the blog. And we'll put out another video to kind of give you the basics, some basics on calligraphy. Because when you look at these older uh, handwriting. handwritings, they have very beautiful calligraphy handwriting. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it'd be a neat thing to do to do our memorized scriptures that way. Right. So we'll have a template for like how to make it fit. Because when we're done with the end of the year, we'll put some holes in it. We'll stitch it together. We'll bind it. We'll make it like a book. It's not going to be super thick. because There's only going to be about 48 scriptures. But we'll bind it. We'll, we'll turn it into a book. And so... It's a great time to practice your handwriting. Would you, Oliver have written in print? No. no. What was print reserved for? Printing. <laughs> books, right? Printing and books. So I was studying this when, when I was teaching you guys handwriting and when, I, when we were running the school. And I read something once and it talked about how they figured any dummy could, ca could copy the print out of a printed book. They never taught print. They only talk cursive because anybody can copy this. <laughs> and so they, even from the time they ever started writing, they learned cursive. So this is a great time to practice your cursive. We'll, I, I'm thinking that we're going to do a template every week that you can trace. If you would like to trace them and practice your handwriting with tracing, great. Or take the idea and do your own handwriting. Work on your own calligraphy style and your own uh, uh, handwriting, right? Your cursive handwriting. And really, you know, I think it's a beautiful skill, especially when you get into doing family history and reading old records. I've done a lot of transcribing this last couple of months. And boy, somebody's hand, some of these handwritings are really crazy. We learned a little while ago that depending on, on the sound of the S, they would write a different style of S that looked like an F. And I've seen that in old scripts and I knew what the word was so I knew it was an S and I couldn't figure out why they were writing it the way they were it has to do with how the S sounded we don't even do that anymore but so if you get into some old document you think it's an F but it, an S makes more sense probably was an S <laughs> mm -hmm. but to go along with our subject of having faith and not doubting let's close today with the song on page 128 when faith endures if you're watching you will notice the Brother Cummings does not sing along with us on this song. <laughs> we started this just right, right before. We kind of made a last minute decision on this song. And he says, I don't know this song. He really doesn't. We tried. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to be our audience, just like you. And we're going to sing When Faith Endures, which is song number 128 in the hymn book. Catherine, do you have that C for us? Mm. One, two, three. I will not doubt, I will not fear, God's love and strength are always near. His promise gift helps me to find an inner strength and peace of mind. I give the Father willingly my trust, my prayers, you his spirit guides, his law assures that fear departs when faith endures. If you've enjoyed our videos, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And don't forget to find and follow us on Facebook.